testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. I do. Do you have any information concerning political contributions made by Marcello or any of his associates involved in, in the political campaign? Marcello's or none of their associates, uh, to my knowledge, you are their associates, have ever given me one red copper cent directly, indirectly. As a matter of fact, we went to that meeting in New York in 1967. Life magazine freely acknowledged that they were quite aware that the Marcellos had not supported me for governor in 1964. And I presume that's in the so-called transcript you have that they gave you the other day. If it isn't there, then it's false or it's incomplete because they acknowledged that at that meeting in 1967. Uh, do you have any knowledge? I might add that, I, that Mr. Gordon, Mr. Keene, that I presume you checked the background of witnesses who appear here. I wish you would check mine. There's no man ever sat in this governor's office any further removed from this type of influence that Governor Louisiana's got today. Governor Life Magazine alleges that Mr. Leon Gary arranges hospitality through Marcello's, and I quote, personal man, end quote, in Las Vegas, a Mario Marino, outside of the affidavit made by Mr. Garrett to the Wade McDougall Committee. Do you have any information as to the truth or falsity of this license? I don't know how to get any other information other than that, or from Life Magazine. And uh, you people have tried to get them to come here and give the information to you under oath, and they haven't. And uh, so far as uh, Mr. Leon Gary is concerned, I know him a man of honor. And I know him as a decent citizen. And if he is prepared to swear to the truthfulness of something under the penalty of a, making a false affidavit, a false perjury, I presume this committee knows he's anxious to come here before this committee under penalty of perjury. We appreciate that. And tell you the entire story. It is true that he called Lafayette. He told me about it shortly after it occurred when Chandler came and asked him. My life came and asked him because he's fearful they were going to try to write him up a smear. He told me just what he said in his affidavit. And I think perhaps that what I'd be, I'm, what I'd be, the, the best information be from Mr. Gary. But I believe when you hear from Mr. Gary on the oath, you'll be completely satisfied as I am. Uh, Mr. Gary was, I think, 16 years mayor of the town of the city of Homer and a former member of the State Board of Education. A part of people just happen to think he's the best director of highways we've ever had. And when a man tells me something, particularly when he gets on the oath, I'm going to believe him unless something, somebody showed me something differently. Now, if life will come here and show me something differently, well, I'd, uh, I'm prepared to take another look. Uh, he, he'll give you all information he has. I believe, it is, I believe his affidavit shows he called that twice to get reservations, not to get free accommodations for anyone. At that time, he was acting as my administrative assistant. And at that time, I might add that the hotel that he called was not owned by the racketeers. It was owned by Howard Hughes, who was hardly a member of the Mafia. And to say that we do that, we don't, we don't do that courtesy for legislators or anyone else in the state government, particularly when his principal job was to work with legislators and their personal problems and do what courtesies he could for them that were ethical and proper, uh, he was completely in his right in doing it. And I would hope that you would ask him here and let him get on oath and give you a complete explanation. We, we you see, to... what I can't understand, Mr. Keene, is we're here on oath and publicly on a penalty of perjury, and we're just open, open sea and open duck for Life magazine or anyone else. And we're anxious for them to come take the opportunity to give this committee a chance to charge us with perjury. Now, Governor, I'd like to get uh, specifically now to the article of April 10th. Uh, uh, what steps have you taken uh, other than the investigation conducted by General Wade and Mr. McDougall's group to inquire into the truthfulness or falsity of the life allegations. I don't know any other, anyone else to turn to. They're the four of the cleanest, straightest men I know. I have read with interest where it's been said that they just took affidavits from those who were accused and filed them in the record. That's completely fallacious. 
I presume this committee had a copy of the report. We do. They went to the actual tax record on every allegation made, every one of them, and that's in their report. I, for example, talked to Mr. Fred Roth when I attempted to get him to stay in the state service. Uh, ask him, I, I presume you heard what he investigated the part about the high-ranking state police officer called Houston, Texas, and got Tiki Sai released immediately or some sort of statement like that. Mr. Roth went to Houston, and he'll tell this committee, you're investigator now, and spent two days there, and he said it just wasn't true. He told me that personally. It just wasn't true that a police officer called there and got Mr. Sai's release. I wanted to know. He said it wasn't true. Uh, some of those things there uh, that I have had some additional investigation made of, for example, they say in there that I authorized a $500,000 payment to Churchill Farms for the right-of-way for the protection levy in one of those levy districts. I honestly assumed that I had. I didn't think they would have printed it unless I had. It struck me that it was awfully odd that I personally would authorize a payment for a right-of-way for a levy board or a parish council. I asked Mr. Gene Mew, uh, well, as a matter of fact, before we could investigate the Internal Revenue Service, we're up here the next day or in a day or two because they apparently had no record of any $500,000 being paid to Marcello or Churchill Farms. And they were here to see what we had about any $500,000 payment. I instructed Mr. Murat by phone to make a thorough investigation of that and to give it to the Internal Revenue Service. Mr. Murat has in his possession not the record showing of a $500,000 payment, which the record show was never made, as life alleged, but a certified copy of the act of donation from Churchill Farms for the right of way for the levy. And if you have it, you the committee may want to have it. I was going to it's ask the you records in Jefferson Parish, Mr. Murat, do you have a copy of it? He made the investigation, a certified copy of the act of donation. Now my immediate reaction when I when I started investigation was to ask Mr. Donovan Donovan knew if he knew anything about it. And we started from there. And I say, Mr. Murat has made the investigation. I don't have to give you Mr. Murat's in, uh, background. He's my executive counsel. You perhaps would want to put him on the stand. I did not make the investigation, but there in your hand is a certified copy of the act of donation, Mr. Murat says, of that land that Life Magazine said I authorized a $500,000 payment for. Now, I hope this committee may see why I've been sort of indignant. Uh, Life Magazine alleges laxity in the collection of state taxes and, quote, Marcello influence in the Department of Revenue, Governor. Outside of the affidavits which are made a part of the Wade McDougall reports, do you have any information concerning the truth or falsity of these yes, allegations? Yes, sir. In, the, in that report you have there, Mr. McDougall's and General Wade's, but, but and Mr. Dent's and Mr. Murat's, assisted by Mr. Roth, you will find a report on every single solitary business that's listed there as being connected with the Marcellos or their family. Every single solitary business. It lists every year starting back, I believe, in 1960, exactly and precisely what has been done about the taxes on those businesses. And Mr. Keene and I have read that report, and it fails to show that the Marcellos or anyone around them has had any unusual influence over there in the Department of Revenue. As a matter of fact, if you read it, and I hope it could be made, it would be made public other than just people reading it and seeing they saw it, because it lifts step by step on various individuals, the steps the Revenue Department has taken to collect those taxes. It's been difficult, yes. Because almost in every case, insofar as income taxes were concerned, they were contested. A number of the taxes that they, that the Department of Revenue feels they owe are now in litigation with the federal government or, or before our State Board of Tax Appeals. Very recently, the State Board of Tax Appeals entered into an agreement with Marcello's attorneys that determination of the amount of taxes he owed for several years would rest until he had finished his litigation with the federal government 
and that then the State Department of Revenue would accept the conclusion that the federal government accepted. And I would hope this committee would take every single solitary business that's listed in Life magazine and see the steps and trouble that department has gone to in their efforts to collect that money. And it fails to show, in my opinion, by any stretch of the imagination, that the Marcellos or anyone connected with them has given preferential treatment or have been allowed to knowingly or flagrantly beat their taxes as they owe the state of Louisiana. I suspect if the record were side by side that the state of Louisiana, and I wish you would do that for comparison when you finally make your report, that the state of Louisiana has indeed, does indeed compare favorably with what they have been able to collect from the Marcellos as compared to what the federal government has been able to collect with the Marcellos with all their resources and their power. Well, in the same regard, Governor, the magazine article alleges that a former chief counsel of the Department of Revenue, and I quote, used to keep Carlos Marcello's tax files in a draw marked hold action, end quote. Do you have any information concerning the truth of all that? My information is that that is incorrect. I would hope this committee would go into that. Now, if anybody, we, we can find no evidence of that whatsoever. But if, if there's anyone over there in the Revenue Department who had any hold on anything Mark Mosello, all I can say is the record indicates an entirely different thing because there has been nothing held uh, up insofar as the Marcellos are concerned, not from the affidavits, but from the very records of the Department of Revenue itself, as you will see. As you go through those records or you receive the report that Mr. McDougal and his group made on each tax each year for the Marcellos and their associates, that nothing was held up. Uh, and if you have any evidence of it, I say, of course, we'd like to have it because we have no evidence of it, and the record shows that they were, in truth, not held up. Uh, now, they're being held up because of litigation. I say principally with the federal government and because of the appeals they've taken to our Board of Tax Appeals. But the regular routine process and in many instances, and time after time, Mr. Keene, I would hope you'd have that report there before you. You'll find where one of the Marcellos filed a return, said no tax due or a certain amount due. The department refuses return. Audits makes them pay more taxes. That, that report is replete with that if you'll go down through it. Now, Governor, in the same regard, the article alleges that in January 1969, and I quote, Director Millard Byrd set machinery in motion to collect all back taxes owed by Masalo, end quote, and was prematurely retired two months later. Do you have any information concerning the truth or falsity of these allegations? Mr. Uh, Mr. Keene, I would refer you to the report filed by Mr. McDougall and General Wade. Mr. Dent, Mr. Murat, that is specifically covered there. But he was not prematurely retired. As a matter of fact, he was allowed to go on past his retirement age, apparently, notwithstanding an executive order I had issued that no man should be allowed to go past his retirement age. Now, if you go check that, I think you'll find that in the record. Now, Governor, the life article... What I'm saying is that many things you're asking me here are contained in that report. And Mr. McDougall, or General Wade, or Mr. Dent, who made that investigation and who went and studied the... I'm talking about studying the record and the files on each and every allegation can give you the first-hand information what I think that this committee is entitled to. Oh, we, we, I'm just giving information as I read the report. Uh, Governor, the Life article says that Marcello, and I quote, not only continues to dominate the state, but grows vastly richer each year at public expense, end quote. And I ask you, Governor, do you have any information concerning the truth or falsity of that statement? Mr. Keene, I have a state representative here for four years. The last three years of that four years, I was floor leader for the late Earl K. Long, the House of Representatives. I was chairman of the Appropriation Committee. At that time, the Appropriation Committee in the House was also the Budget Committee. We made up the budget there while the legislature was in session. I was chairman of it. I was a very powerful man here when we did not have civil service and when much of the Public Records Act was not then law. 
Uh, I was on the Public Service Commission for nine and one half years. That's an extremely powerful commission. I have been governor for six years. I have never in my 19 years of public life, and this is the reason why I'm so absolutely outraged, I have never felt the least suspicion in 19 years of public service of Marcello or anyone connected with him trying to get me to do anything in 19 years of public service. As a matter of fact, Marcello is the antonym to power in this state. He's the opposite to power. When anyone hears that Marcello is interested in something, they run in all directions. To give you a classic example, on the Dome Stadium Commission, of which I am president, when the projection was made as to where we should place it, public projection by five or six different groups, individuals who own property in New Orleans or the metropolitan area, the projection was made for Churchill Farms in the proper public way. As soon as the committee could get together, it was immediate, unanimous opinion, absolutely, that that was one piece of property we couldn't take if it were given to us. Now, if that is power, I don't understand power. An absolute antonym to power so far as I am concerned. Well, Governor, despite those comments, there seems to be the suggestion in the Life article, at least, that Mr. Marcello continues to prosper in the state of Louisiana. Have you got any suggestions to this committee of what might be done to keep Marcello from prospering in this state? Yes, sir, and I'd like, I'd like to address my thing to one thing other. This, this Labor Management Commission of Inquiry that has been run down and done in so badly, which history will show, in my opinion, did one of the finest jobs ever done for the state of Louisiana. And all of that investigation, and all of that investigation, you have members of your advisory commission, not, no, they weren't on there, but uh, who are familiar with it. Uh, one was on there, yes, one was on there. Mr. Busey was not. Uh, the dean, I believe, was on there, vice chairman. The report will show you that in all of that intensive investigation, we found no evidence of organized crime or the mafia or the Marcellos involved in the sordid situation we had here two years ago. None. Well, they found evidence of violations of the law in their report, but no, no evidence, I think they specifically said, of the mafia or organized crime or, or, or underworld characters, as the record shows has been so prevalent in so much of the rest of these United States of America. Now, repeat again, that's another reason why I'm outraged by the statement in there that Carlos Marcello dominates the state of Louisiana. That's what they said, that he dominates the state of Louisiana. I don't know anything he dominates. If there's anything in state government he dominated, I think I would know it. Mr. Keene, we have 50,000 state employees, almost. I wish you'd hear me well. If we can keep the crooks down to 1%, we're doing better than private industry tells me they can do. That will still leave us with 500 crooks in state government. Now, if you spend several hundred thousand dollars here and get enough investigators, you're going to find some of those crooks. We would eventually find them anyway. But you'll find some. And you may find a little man down there who, who collects, supposed to collect the tax on a pinball machine that's making $375 a month. Or you may find a man in a high echelon that some crook has gotten to. Or maybe even someone connected with the Marcellos have gotten to. But you can investigate yourself till doomsday here, as every decent citizen in this state knows, and you're going to find, I repeat again, that Carlos Marcello doesn't dominate even one small bit of the state of Louisiana. 
Now, he may have found some weaklings somewhere out of 50,000 that he can get to a little. And I repeat again, if we've kept it down to 1%, we've done better than private industry has done because they've told me so. Well, Governor, my question really is that uh, we seem to have this continuing uh, uh, inference being made by Life magazine and perhaps others that there is, uh, uh, that Marcello and his uh, group prosper in the state of Louisiana. My question is, in this committee, is one of the things this committee will have to perhaps come up with, what steps can we take as I a state or legislature to keep Marcello from prospering in this state? I'd like, to, uh, before I go in there, I'd like to address myself to one, one thing else. I think Life magazine has an ulterior motive in writing those articles. First, to sell the articles. Second, uh, they think that Ed Parton was the greatest thing that has been sent down from the blue. I presume you know that. That's the reason why I said a few moments ago, they've told me that. I terribly mistreated poor Ed was being handled in this state. Go back and check the timing of your articles and see when they came out. Shortly after we started the investigation here, because the paper said it was pointed because the paper said it was pointing toward teams, teams at local number five. Get your timing on that. Within a few days, Parton was boasting that Life magazine was going to, in truth, get the governor. He has boasted to the investigators of the Labor Management Commission that Life magazine was going to get me, and that a disliked Justice Department was going to get me, Mr. Keene. I can tell you that elements of the Justice Department tried, as Mr. Parton said they would. This thing goes awfully deep. And to prove uh, uh, to, that how influential he was with the news media of this nation, in front of the investigators of the Labor Management Commission, he picked up the phone and called a man who used to be the chief investigator of the Justice Department, who was then with NBC, and proved by him and the presence of our investigators that Life Magazine was in truth going to write an article which he implied would get me so busy that I would not be interested anymore in the labor business in the Baton Rouge area. I think that's something this commission might like to go into, and I can tell you further, Mr. Keene, that Mr. Parton told me himself that the managing editor of Life magazine, who has recently retired, was the trustee for the money which he was paid by Life magazine when he wrote the articles about Hoffa. So I'm giving you some things that you, you say you want to go in depth, that you might really want to go in depth. You have no idea, and this committee doesn't have any idea what I've been through in labor management. I not only did not get the cooperation of the Justice Department, I was harassed by them, and they tried to get me in trouble, and Life magazine was right with them. It's an unholy lot, and if you want to really go in depth, you ought to go and dig real deep. Now, what can we do to stop it? Well, we had a good start today if we can get our bills out of the committee. The commission which I appointed over two years ago. Some of them are meeting opposition. I gather that a great bulk of them will pass, and they will help us. But here's the way I think the Marcellos can be brought to their knees. If respected businessmen respectable businessmen of the greater metropolitan area will quit doing business with Marcello and the companies he allegedly owns so that he can profit. They will bring him to his knees within three to six months. But no, they won't do that. They continue to sell, sell and buy to those companies which he purportedly owns and go to their clubs and their Brooks Brothers suits and point fingers at public officials. Now why don't you stop it when they've got the power to stop it? And I would suggest to that task force that's coming down here, talking about the sophistication, if they're anxious to stop, they might suggest to the business community of New Orleans to quit doing business with him and his companies. You see, do I know that? 
Well, I'll tell you how well I know it. When Jim Garrison subpoenaed them in the fall of 1967 to appear before that grand jury, that was one of the reasons I moved my office upstairs. It wouldn't hold the businessmen from New Orleans who were up here attempting to prevail upon me to get Jim Garrison, my friend, to cancel the subpoenas because they were in truth selling and buying with Marcello's companies and they didn't want to be embarrassed. Now, if they will stop doing business with them down there and spend some time on that, rather than pointing their finger at every official they can, I think they can bring them to the knees and they'll quit prospering, as they purportedly are. And I think, as Mr. Cronvich said, that as you go into this investigation, you get your information, you're going to find that that's where he's prospering as in his so-called legitimate business. Apparently, if he's making a lot of money, he's got to be making it out of old legitimate enterprises there. Now, under the law, as, as this committee knows, and the federal government knows all too well, there's nothing we can do legally about those legitimate businesses. But the people who are trading with them and selling them and making money off of them by selling them equipment and merchandise for resale, et cetera, if they would boycott them tomorrow, the businesses would not exist very long. I have heard no one suggest that from the metropolitan area, but I have heard them with their finger a shaking about the officials in the city and in Baton Rouge and in Jefferson Parish, virtually day and night. And I say that the officials here have done about all they can do. And what we haven't done, we are now trying to get the power to do with the set of laws we're recommending to the legislature. And I'm saying the one area where there is no pressure being placed now and where no effort is being made to dry up sources of income is not being used. That is a respectable businessman of the metropolitan area and in the rest of the state refusing to do business with those businesses which have been blacklisted by the federal government and by the various crime commissions there in New Orleans. I think it would dry him up. No one suggests that. I don't know why.